from San Jose, California, and brought to you by Think Tank Learning. Welcome to Meet the Experts. This is a forum in which we pick the brains of experts and professionals from various industries. We give students inspiration by showing them the academic journeys that they can imitate as they prepare to become experts themselves. I'm your host, David Dick Schnuen, and today we're going to talk about the structure and function of tubulin in disease. Did you know that there are railroad tracks inside your cells? Particles, pouches, and even DNA are pulled around in, by machines that walk on these railroad tracks. Unlike permanent railroad tracks that we drive across in our cars, uh, railroad tracks inside your cells can quickly uh, form and then break apart in a matter of seconds. Knowing how these railroad tracks work allows scientists to control them so that we can better understand health and disease. Our special guest today is at the forefront of studying these railroad tracks inside of cells. In fact, she was the first person to figure out the structure of the basic building block that forms these railroads. She is Ava Nogales. Ava Nogales carried out her bachelor studies in physics at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Translated in English, it is the public university of Madrid in Spain. She then did her PhD at the Synchrotron Radiation Source in the UK. Her postdoctoral uh, work was in the lab of Ken Downing at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Okay, and there uh, she produced the first atomic structure of tubulin using electron crystallography. She then joined the molecular and cell biology department uh, in UC Berkeley in 1998. Since 2000, she is an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She is also senior staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Presently, she is professor and head in the biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology division of the molecular and cell biology department at UC Berkeley. And on top of all these things, she is a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Nogales, welcome to Meet the Experts. Hello, David. Hi, it's great to have you. Now, uh, before we get into the questions, uh, you know, I want our audience to know, uh, you know, the, uh, the what it is that you've been able to accomplish. Um, so when I was doing uh, you know, research as a grad student, uh, you know, and a postdoc, I interacted with many scientists, right, from Europe. And uh, they would often tell me how hard it was for somebody to do their education in Europe and then get a postdoc in the States, right? And then eventually get a faculty member, right? Well, you did that. And not only that, you've done it at the highest level, right, of research, right? And you're now a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And so uh, I want the audience to know that, uh, you know, what, what it, that in every category, you were statistically disadvantaged, right? But you kind of smashed every single ceiling there, right? So it's pretty amazing that you've been able to accomplish that. Uh, thank you. I think I was um, given opportunities in life and I did my best to take advantage of them and grab them when I could and, uh, and it has gone very well. So I'm very pleased to have made it all the way to UC Berkeley and LBL. Ah, wonderful. And so uh, our first question, you know, uh, to piggyback off uh, what was just discussed. Um, so there's been a trending push to encourage more women to join the STEM fields, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, what initially inspired you to pursue a career in STEM? Uh, and what words of encouragement do you have for young women wanting to be like you? Um, so I think I was interested in science very early in life and there were certain figures from TV to my high school that inspired me. Um, but um, definitely the people that make the biggest impression were my math, physics and biology teachers in high school. Three of them were actually women. They were incredibly capable and very, very inspiring, super dedicated. And I, I still meet with them uh, when I have the opportunity. Um, I think they were an example of how you can be very analytical, um, intellectually engaged and pursue your dream irrespective of whether you are or not a woman. When I studied in Madrid, I studied physics, and just to give you an idea, there wasn't a single female faculty at the time. But things were already changing. We were probably already 40% of the, of the students in physics were, were women at the, at the time, and things had gone better. Um, I think in STEM, the latest, you know, generationally, those that are now emeritus had a really, really hard time getting into biology, physics, or chemistry. 
we benefited tremendously from their efforts and the, the path that they paid for us. Uh, and now um, I think STEM fields are much the better by having incorporated women. And although this is still a long way to go, um, societies, um, scientific societies from the National Academy to the Biophysical Society, et cetera, et cetera, I could cite many, um, are, you know, are well aware that there's still not a 50-50% uh, of scientists in these fields and they're doing the best going all the way back to um, influencing kids early on in, in middle school and um, to... Um, to see that there is, if, if they're interested, there's a potential for them and that should, uh, girls should be encouraged to pursue their dreams. And there are many, many examples now that they can follow. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Well, with that, let's jump into our questions about mm -hmm. science. Okay. So first of all, why don't you tell us what is tubulin and what is a microtubule? Very good. So, David, if you, um, if you think it's okay, what I would like to do is to share my screen with everybody watching us so okay. that I can show you an animation of how these things look. Um, so, just bear with me for a second. Can you see them? Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, so, this is a cartoon representation of tubulin. Tubulin is actually... What is called a heterodimer is a dimer of two different proteins that are called alpha and beta tubulin and that I will be presenting here. Alpha tubulin always in green and beta tubulin sometimes in blue, sometimes in red. You'll see. In any case, this is the building block of microtubules. Uh, microtubules are formed by the head-to-tail association of alpha-beta tubulin dimers making what we call protofilaments. And then 13 protofilaments associate laterally with a certain geometry given rise ultimately to the closure of a tube um, that, because it's very small, we call a microtubule. Now, microtubules exist in all cells um, and they form what you would call freeways inside the cell for the transport of objects. Um, so microtubule cells serve as railroads, as you indicated, where motor proteins, or other type of proteins, um, are able to walk, carrying uh, different types of cargoes that can be organelles, proteins, DNA, etc. Microtubules also can form organized structures in the tail of uh, flagellated cells, like sperms, and they, by moving one with respect to the other, they can make beating of the flagella propel the cell in an, in an aqueous environment. That happens in some types of cells. What happens in all cells that divide is that the microtubules form a large cellular structure, which is called the mitotic spindle, that grabs chromosomes, which is condensed DNA, your condensed genome, aligns them in the center of the cell, and then upon separation of the two copies of the chromosomes are able to separate each of them to one end of the cell. So David, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna show some animations of this process. Definitely. Um, so this is, I'm gonna show you a video of uh, obtained by phase light microscopy. This is a cell where the chromosomes have already duplicated and condensed and you're going to see them moving around. They seem to be moving by themselves, but they're not. They're being pushed and pulled by microtubules, which in this type of microscopy are almost invisible, so very hard to see. I hope you can see that these chromosomes are organizing until they're all lined up in the middle of the cell, and when the cell detects that they're all, absolutely all of them aligned, it sends a signal that separates the two copies, and then you can see how each copy separates from one another going to each two of the two ends of the cell, which eventually will split in the middle, giving rise to two daughter cells. So here microtubules were invisible, but I'm showing you a, neat, a different type of microscopy, it uses polarized light and polymers now, like microtubules, are very easily seen as these white lines that were grabbing onto the chromosomes and then pulling them apart. And just to complete this image, and as a way of summary, 
Um, mm, tubulin self-assemble into these microtubules, and these microtubules are very dynamic, okay? Uh, this dynamic is very important for cell division, as, as you can see in these four snapshots uh, obtained by a different type of light microscopy called fluorescence microscopy. Um, this is not showed, I'm showing you just two components of the cells that have been labeled with fluorophores. In green is tubulin, so you can see the microtubules, and in blue is DNA, so you can see the chromosomes. And through this snapshot, you can see how the microtubules organize until they reach that beautiful bipolar spindle where all the chromosomes are aligned in the center. And then through the shrinking, the depolymerization of the microtubules, the two copies of the chromosome in the last snapshot will be separated. Um, we're going to be talking about medical relevance. This process, this switch from one state to the other through the formation of the mitotic spindle and, this, and the separation of the chromosomes can be stopped by anti-cancer agents like Taxol that bind to tubulin and make microtubules very stable. And when they are very stable, they get stuck in that beautiful picture that you see that where the chromosomes are in the middle and then they cannot be separated and the cell ends up dying. So this is a process that is very important for all cells, but we can manipulate for the treatment of disease. Back to you, David. Wow, wonderful. Thank you for those uh, stunning visuals. Okay, so um, the, and your, your last slide's a perfect segue to our next question. That is, what medical breakthroughs have come from understanding how tubulin works? Um, so I think the most important thing is that Shall I stop sharing my screens? I'm not sure. Um, is that um, being essential for the life of the cell, there are very few genetic diseases actually uh, that have to do with mutations in tubulin because when these happen, the effects are so deleterious for the cell that normally uh, that fetus will never progress and you will have a stillborn. There are a few cases where um, defects give rise in, in microtubules, give rise to neuro, neuro, neurological diseases. This has to do with the fact that microtubules are particularly abundant in neurons. Neurons are cells that you, you guys may have seen in your textbooks that have very long extensions called axons. Um, that are used for connections between neurons or between neurons and muscles. And in these axons, they have to be transported from the main part of the cell all the way to the end. These axons can be millimeters, centimeters, or even meters in length. And these are filled up with microtubules. If the microtubule organization fails to progress appropriately, these, connect these neuronal connections deteriorate or they're not formed properly. And there are a number of neural diseases that are related to that. But the knowledge of how microtubules work have been particularly relevant in the study, in the treatment of cancer. So if you think about it, cancer is a disease in which cells are dividing in an uncontrolled way. Um, they are proliferating um, out of control. And one way to target them is to uh, stop that cell proliferation. I just show you how important microtubules are in the process of cell division. So drugs like Taxol that bind to tubulin and stop the normal behavior of microtubule can be used to stop uh, the cancer process. So Taxol is actually um, an, a drug that is used almost in all solid tumors. So ovarian, prostate, breast cancer, for example either by itself or in, or in combination. <clears throat> uh, Taxol have a number of, of uh, problems, uh, both in the way it is delivered and in the fact that resistance can be gained. So by knowing how tubulin works, it is possible to design uh, new drug, test them in vitro for their properties, and then be able to uh, put them back in, in, in patients um, for the treatment of cancer. So I would say that has been uh, a major goal in the, in the study of tubulin to understand better 
anti-cancer agents and allow the development of better ones with less secondary effects in, on patients. Wow, okay. So then, um, what would you say are the current challenges and future frontiers uh, about you know, tubulin research? Okay, so for that, again, I'm gonna go back, if you don't mind, to, um, to my screen and to the presentation that I had with you. Um, so in here, I was telling you that microtubules are very dynamic and that dynamic property is required to undergo all these transformations that they do uh, uh, in the cell to, to separate chromosomes. That occurs because microtubules are metastable polymers. What does this mean? And by the way, we're, uh, we, we still see you. Uh, and so oh. if you yeah, so if you want to share screen, you should yeah, click the share screen, or share screen button. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so, there we go. Uh, so this is where we left it. Um, so in order for for the whole microtubule uh, array in the cell to be able to reorganize like that, every single microtubule has to have the property of being metastable. And this is shown here with another video of a cell that is alive and where you see individual microtubules that are growing and suddenly they stop growing and start shrinking. Um, this is a property that is called dynamic instability. It's a, a, it, it's a metastable behavior that necessarily requires um, the use of energy uh, to be maintained. So um, I'm gonna show you another animation that illustrates the point. So the, the source of energy in biological process is typically a small molecule that can exist in two states, a high energy and a low energy. And proteins combine to this a small molecule. I'm gonna say the name, but you may uh, forget. It's called GTP, it stands for guanosine triphosphate. When the protein is bind to this molecule, is in a certain configuration. It has a certain shape and certain chemical properties. Uh, in here, when tubulin is bound to GTP, I'm representing it um, red in the top, okay? This um, molecule, however, can go transition into a low energy state and the protein that is bound to it will therefore change in conformation. And here that is represented by a tubulin molecule that is blue on the top. The trick in microtubules is that only the red tubulin can bind and, and add to a growing microtubule end. But when it comes, um, it causes the change in the molecule that is right behind that switches to the blue state. Red and blue is just a metaphor, if you want, for uh, a change in the structure of the, of the molecule that we, my lab is very interested in. So this is the animation that shows how that assembly and the change in the structure of tubulin is coupled. So tubulins are coming, they are adding, and every time they add, they switch the color of the protein that is underneath. Eventually, microtubule can get to this state in which there's no more red containing subunits. And that is unsustainable. The structure of tubulin is such now that it cannot keep together and the microtubule fall apart. And they do it by peeling of protofilaments that separate from each other and curl. We want to understand how this works because this is the process that drugs like Taxol are inhibiting, making microtubules to be too rigid, too stable, and stopping cells from dividing. So we want to answer, to get to the, the questions that link these, um, these changes in tubulin to the uh, lack of stability of microtubules. But this is the problem. How are we going to be able to get details on this structure? The problem has to do with the fact that microtubules are very small, and we need... To visualize them, we need very powerful microscopes. So uh, this scale of life is just a representation of different scales that did need different instruments uh, for visualization. So in the normal scale of our life, where things are of the order of one meter or one yard, if you prefer, um, our eyes are good enough. But if we go to small 
to things that are a thousand times smaller, so of the order of one millimeter, and that would be an example will be a flea in the dog. Um, that may require either very good eyes of young people like you, like you, David, and our audience, but my eyes are not already not good enough, so I will need some kind of magnifying glass. Um, that will just about do it. But what if I want to see something that is a thousand times smaller than the flea, which is a millionth time smaller than the dog? This is about the size of a bacteria, about one micron. Um, for that, I will need very powerful light microscope just to detect the presence of the bacteria. To get into the structure inside the bacteria, I would already need electron microscope. But what I'm talking about are small molecules that are present, millions of them, inside a cell. And those are in the scale of, of nanometers. That is now a, mil, a billionth the size of a dog. And only very powerful instruments, electron microscopes, uh, are going to be able to directly visualize those kind of structures. Um, so we need to use a state-of-the-art microscopy techniques in order to visualize microtubules. I want to show you how microtubules look in the electron microscope. Unfortunately, electron microscope don't give us colors, it's all gray levels. Um, this, these are different microtubules that you can, you can see going across the image. What we do is we start with images like this, maybe thousands of them. We split them into pieces that correspond to different fragments of microtubules, and then we computationally put them together to get the structure at the highest possible resolution. Um, and this is an example of how a microtubule really looks. Um, this was something that Greg and Gabe, a graduate student and a postdoc in my lab, published um, a couple of years ago. Since then, just due to technological development in detectors, these are the cameras that we use to record the images in our electron microscope, we've been able to improve the resolution of those structures to the point that now we see um, great details so small that we can trace the polypeptide chain and generate atomic models of the structure. Uh, this was done by Rui, a postdoc in the lab, and I'm going to just zoom in um, to show you that we can now see where the atoms within the proteins are. In this case, these are the ones that are making the lateral contact between protofilaments. Carbon is here shown in green, nitrogen in blue, and oxygen in red. Um, to obtain this, as I said, we have to obtain millions of images and do very heavy computational data analysis that may require many months of, of analysis. Wow. Okay. And so the image that we're watching now, on this, uh, the most recent image, well, is that uh, after the data is now analyzed or that's in the process of... Uh... This, so this, um, this is what we call a density map. This is what comes out of, uh, of many, you know, uh, thousands if not millions of CPU hours of data processing. Wow. Okay. Uh, what comes, what we need to do next is to model the atomic structure, and that is like a 3D jigsaw puzzle where you have to find the position of every atom within that structure. That requires additional computation um, that has to do with the interpretation of the, of the map. Mm -hmm. So the computation comes into, into different uh, regimes or uh, two different steps. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. It's amazing. Okay. So, by the way, we've used this technique to see how taxol binds to microtubules, how other more novel, innovative anti cancer agents bind to the microtubule, how they change the structure of tubulin, how they stabilize the microtubules. And, uh, and we think that this is going to be very important going forward for pharmaceutical companies to improve those agents for better, better treatment. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that we can do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Wow, okay. All right, and so uh, let's switch gears a bit uh, and, and uh, talk less about science, but more about uh, your uh, academic uh, journey. Um, but before then, I guess one, one more science question. I guess, does your lab have a preferred experimental method 
for revealing the structure of proteins? Sure, yes. So uh, I've already been telling you about the method. It's electron microscopy. We, more specifically, we call it, we call it cryo electron microscopy. The cryo comes from the fact that when we study these biomolecules, the first thing that we have to do is to cool them to liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, we do that at, you know, by freezing them at very, very uh, high rates, you know, lowering the temperature at a rate of almost a million degrees per second. And that is done so that the, the molecules are very well preserved and the water molecules that are around it don't even have the time to reorganize into a crystal, which is what you have in ice, uh, but rather it's stayed in an, in an amorphous state. This is how we can put biological samples inside an electron microscope. An electron microscope operates under vacuum. Um, and biological molecules need to be in an aqueous state to exist. So the only way to do this, um, because if you put them in water in the vacuum of the microscope, the water will evaporate and the molecule will disintegrate, is to have them in solid water that is very, very cold. And if that water will not evaporate, it will not sublimate inside the vacuum of the scope. That's number one. The other reason is that when electrons go through the sample, these are very high energy electrons, they're moving at close to relativistic speeds, they damage the sample. Um, and they do so by breaking bonds and generating reactive chemical species that then move around and keep breaking bonds and, and destroying the molecule. So by lowering the temperatures to liquid nitrogen temperature, those radicals are not able to move very far because they move by diffusion. They're kind of trapped. And that allows the preservation of the sample enough that we can take images before they get completely destroyed. So this is a very, very successful technique that is right now very much in vogue. So Nature Methods uh, Magazine declare cryo-electron microscopy technique of the year. And that's what we use in the lab. Wow, okay. Well, a great shout out for that technique. <laughs> All right, okay. So uh, the majority of our uh, new audience, uh, you know, are high school students and college students, and of course their parents, right? And so uh, we'd like uh, for you to describe your academic journey starting from high school. Very good. Um, so one of the things that I want to mention is that in, in Spain, like in most of Europe, uh, your decision to go into medical school is made right at the high school level. So you don't need to get a bachelor's before you go to medical school. By the way, you don't need to get a bachelor's to get into law school either. You go directly into this specialty. And, you know, normally very good students like here, they tend to go into medical school. And I was, con I conceived to go into medical school and because I came across some magazines, um, I, and I realized that they were turning my stomach. I knew that was not made for medicine. And I tried to go as far away from it as I could. So I decided to go into physics. Um, and this was also due to the fact that I had brilliant math and physics uh, teachers in my high school. So uh, in Spain, the other thing that happens is that you don't choose your university. So students listen to this. By law, basically, you have to go to the school that is closest to your parents' address, and you keep living with your parents during high school, I mean, so during college. So think about that. Um, so I, I studied physics at the Universidad Autónoma, which happened to be one of the, if not the best, physics, uh, physics uh, university in Spain, uh, definitely at the time. And then what happened was very serendipitous, which um, was that um, at the time when I was graduating and having to decide what to do, and I knew that I wanted to go into academia and research, so I, need, I knew that I was going to do a PhD, they were building the European Synchrotron Radiation Source. This is a high-energy particle accelerator that is used to generate X-rays that then are utilized for probing materials, either biological materials or inorganic materials. Um, and one very large European consortium was, come, had come together to build this large machine in the south of France, and Spain was going to be one of the members of that consortium. They needed to 
uh, train people in synchrotron radiation. So they generated um, a, a scholarship that I wanted to apply to. And in principle, I was going to do physics. I was going to do surface science at Grenoble. And, but I met um, who was then the director of the synchrotron that already existed in England. And he was looking for students. He was very charismatic. He was a mathematician that had moved into biology, and I decided to follow him, and, um, and I moved to England to do my PhD, and I got fascinated by self-assembly biolo self biological systems, and that's how I started working on microtubules. And the techniques that I was using um, that was based on x-rays uh, have not proven very useful to study my... Uh, you know, my in, to follow my interest on the self-assembly of tubulin. And I had already uh, used electron microscopy as, as a side technique. And when I was looking for postdoctoral positions, uh, I came to Berkeley. Uh, my boyfriend now then, my husband now, uh, was being recruited to the new synchrotron that was being built here in Berkeley, which is called the Advanced Light Source. It's on the, on the top of the hill, the one with the purple dome, if you're at, at Berkeley. Um, I happened to meet Ken Downing, who was an expert in electron crystallography. It's just a specific type of cryo-electron microscopy technique. And he wanted to study tubulin. And when he found out that I had already studied tubulin in my PhD, he hired me as a postdoc, and um, together with Sharon Wolf, another postdoc in the lab, and Ken, we worked very hard for five years, and ultimately, we were able to obtain the structure of tubulin. It was not in a microtubule. At that point, that was not possible. Uh, it was in a two-dimensional crystal um, of tubulin. It gave us the structure of tubulin, but it didn't give us the information on how tubulin comes together in the microtubule, and that has become... Have, that became one major theme of a study in my lab. And the rest of history, because I have obtained the structure of tubulin, which was a big deal. Um, I got a position at UC Berkeley. Then I became a Howard Hughes investigator, which um, means that the Howard Hughes Medical Institute gave me a lot of money to do my research. Uh, and things went well, because I had fantastic uh, students and graduate students and postdocs here at Berkeley. Wow, okay. And the story continues. We look forward yeah, to yeah. what else will come out of your lab in the coming years. Okay. All right. Um, and so what advice uh, do you have for uh, current high school students who might want to pursue a career in your field of you know, electron microscopy, structural biology? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my recommendation is that um, they read a lot, that they read a lot um, of science papers so that they are aware of what are exciting fields, but most importantly, that they engage, if they can, with real laboratories that are doing research. There are opportunities for uh, high school students, uh, not all the time, like don't run to me tomorrow with emails saying, I want to work in your lab. I'm right now up to here with people I cannot see any, anyone else in the lab right now, but there are, you know, this is the moment. There are all the times where we have had um, high school students that have come to our labs typically during the months of the summer. Uh, there are lots of opportunities, uh, especially in the, in the Bay Area. It's not only uh, UC Berkeley, it's also UCSF, it's in Stanford, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, has very, very strong science and a very strong biology uh, divisions and I think just to have a flavor of what real science is like um, when we scientists talk we always give you the final results but to get there they were you know the reason why it took me four years to get the structure of tubuli is that for many 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 months things didn't work um, but uh, just being in the lab uh, surrounded by people that are also interested in science that think logically that are passionate about new knowledge it's just a very, very invigorating experience. Wow, wonderful. Okay, so, um, so it's easy. Uh, we, you know, we invite speakers like you to come on because so, it's important to, for students to have role models, right? Like you have role models. Uh, and it's easy for them to be inspired by someone like you. 
but it's also uh, easy for them to be intimidated by someone like you, right? Uh, who you know, you know. At least now we see, you know, that you're very successful. You know what I'm saying? And so, but we want students to know that, um, you know, it is a journey, right? And uh, things don't always go smoothly. And so, we invite our speakers to share if there were times in your academic journey when you felt, you know, inadequate or you wanted to quit. Oh, oh my God! Of course. I mean, we all we all go through those um, through those low moments. And in fact. Um, I always said that science is not for the faint of heart because things go in, in waves. So sometimes things are going really, really well and all those things get stuck. And, um, and I, I, there were many times in my career when I felt inadequate, that I was not going to be able, that, that I was not up to the task. It happened to me, especially during my PhD, when you start and you're already surrounded by people that are very knowledgeable and you, you really just taking the first steps and it, it, it seems like you're never going to be there and that you're stupid, but it's not that, it's that you're just young. Um, I have a colleague, a very dear colleague, a fantastic scientist in, here in Berkeley. His name is Carlos Bustamante, who um, uh, at, a, at, at a symposium mentioned the fact that scientists by default are people that have to feel inadequate because we are at the frontier of knowledge. Um, you know, many other professions, you go and you, you're doing the same thing every day. You cannot do it any better or any worse. There's very clear uh, um, established norms and, and you know exactly what you have to do and what one day is going to be after the next. We are breaking new ground. And there are things that we don't know today and that we may know a, a few years uh, later and it requires many trials, try new techniques, try in many different ways, and by nature, we feel inadequate. And we, we go through process of self-doubt, more, some people more than others. Um, we have to be guided by uh, both a passion, not only for the discovery, but for the process of discovery. That's what I was saying. It's very important to have an experience that show you that uh, everybody uh, has to face many, many days where, where experiments don't work. If they work first time, we will know everything by now, and that's not the case. We, you know, scientists have to struggle at this frontier of between what is known and what is unknown. So we all go through it. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully discoveries come, as, you know, now and then, and we just get refueled and, and, and ready to keep going. <laughs> All right, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I guess the last question about uh, academics. Uh, so typically in high school, students who study physics, right, they often don't see themselves eventually working in biology, right? They see themselves uh -huh. in engineering or like aerospace or stuff like that, right? What? So uh, what type of background courses would you recommend a student, you know, high school students start taking in order to eventually do the research that uh, you do? You know, it's very important that uh, students now know that the the boundaries between what have been classical fields are breaking more and more. So um, I don't think anybody will doubt that the 21st century is the century of biology, I'm, uh, is my opinion, and I think many would agree. But it is also true that biology is becoming more and more quantitative and is drawing more and more from the fields of physics, chemistry, uh, biology, bioengineering. And... Um, it's, all, it's very hard not to uh, be, to do really um, a state-of-the-art research without being right at the frontiers between, between different, different disciplines. So, you know, I would say that students really, at any given point, you should study those courses that are more attractive to you. I think over-planning is, is, is not too good. Um, <laughs> I think if you study what you're interested in, you're going to get more out of it. You're going to do better in, 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 with your grades, but it also will tell you what to do next. Um, but uh, no matter what field of science, I think, you know, a quantitative training where you're very strong in math, so you are prepared in the statistics um, to be able to analyze your data in a more rigorous way and, and also compute, you know, if you are com computationally savvy, there's absolutely no science right now that is not done uh, involving some serious computation uh, in the process. So um, for my particular area of study, 
mm, because uh, we the, the methodology is being developed and it involves physical principles of you know electron scattering, optics, uh, computation with heavy mathematics and things like that. There's many people actually in my field doing biology now that were trained as physicists and mathematicians. But right now the methodology is getting so mature that more molecular biologists and bio, biochemists will use it now um, as, it, as it become more, more broadly applicable. Um, I think my field is now attracting computer scientists because as I told you, from the images to the structures, there's a lot of computation and there are many things that we could still do in better. So we need that groundbreaking now on the computational side, bringing in uh, new expertise in those areas. Follow your passion when you're choosing your courses. That's my main thing. Okay, definitely. All right, I think that's uh, all questions uh, you know, in this uh, Q&A uh, section. And now we'll move to uh, listener questions. So Alistair will read the questions to you. Hi, everybody. I'm the moderator for this webinar. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions. So the first one is from Sean. Sean asks, my daughter wants to get into research in a lab. Um, what do you look for when people apply to your lab? Um, so I would say people that are really motivated to test their waters on research rather than those that are just wanting to add one more line into their CV. That's very important to me because um, no matter what, no matter how clever you are, how much attention to detail and how careful you are, experiments are not going to work the first time. And I don't want people to just give up and feel depressed about it. And if you only wanted a, a line in your CV, you will very quickly get discouraged and want to leave. And then it would have been a waste of time for you and for the people in the lab that went through all your training. Um, so this is the, the main thing, you know, people that are truly curious about the scientific experience, that's very important. Um, I would want to have people that are doing at least relatively well in their courses because otherwise I feel that they should be studying and, and getting prepared during the summer instead of doing research. And, and I think the, the research experience should never take away from getting your academics in, in order. Um, but otherwise, you know, you need people that are very responsible. We do have to follow protocols. We have to be very good about writing down all the details of what we do so that what we do can be reproduced, what we do um, can be systematically tested. So, you know, you, you want people that are enthusiastic, but also mature and responsible. Mm, well said. Well yeah, said. Very much. <laughs> okay. Second question. Um, it's from Jasmine. She asks, could you describe the moment you knew you were the first to discover the atomic structure of tubulin? Oh my God, yeah, I remember it so well. So, yeah, it gives me good goosebumps. So you have to realize that I had to spend four years in my PhD and already four years during my postdoc trying to decipher the structure of tubulin. And in the last period, it was when I had a map, like the one that I showed you that was in colors, and I was trying to trace the chemical, uh, you know, the polypeptide bond, so the, these atoms through the structure. And it's this three-dimensional three jigsaw puzzle. And to do that, uh, in those days, this was a long time ago, I'm quite old, you can say by the gray. Um, so we, we were using these um, a stereo glasses to look at a, at a stereo sc a screen and some dial box where we were moving the molecules and things like that. So, and I would spend hours and hours doing this and I would get home and my neck would be completely rigid and I couldn't move and I was in so much pain, literally physical pain. And it, it, this built up to a point when I suddenly, everything got connected and it's like this just so puzzle materialized. And it was, it was amazing. And <laughs> What I did immediately was to call my PhD supervisor, Ken, and you say, Ken, I got it, I got it, I know how it looks, the whole thing fits, I got the structure. It was, it was just super exciting. So now I don't, you know, 
my graduate students and my, my postdocs are doing this. And I love it when they are sharing it with me, when I can sit with them at the computer, especially, you know, at those uh, stages when, when, when things finally, you know, come up. But I have to tell you, I also am okay with meeting with them in the way where they get stuck and things are not working and we are together trying to, you know, to work out a solution. So the Eureka moments are great, but they are particularly great because it takes a long time to get there. And if, if it's going to be a big finding, it's because many people have tried and did not succeed. So it typically is going to take you a long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question from Tim. Um, Tim asks, I want to do research in cell bio, but I feel like a lot of items have been discovered already. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That is funny. I have to tell you. There is what? so much that we don't know. I will not tell you because it's, it's crazy it's scary. And this is the most, every time we make a discovery, we realize more of what we don't know. Cell biology is in its absolute infancy. If, if the lifetime of cell biology is, is 100 years, we are on the date of birth, to give you an idea. Do not worry. Things are not going to be end, finished by <laughs> any time soon. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Gotcha. Uh, just to give you an idea, I studied physics as an undergraduate. The basic, uh, most of the basic uh, physics, you know, mechanics, electromagnetism, even quantum mechanics, they were all done by, you know, the, the 1950s. And those textbooks have not changed since then. We have to change the molecular and cell biology textbooks every other year which is really costly for everybody, but it's because so much is being discovered all the time. And if you were to do research in a lab, it's very likely that you will see your research in a textbook two or three years mm. from, from, from the moment that discovery was made. So very funny question. It's very interesting. This is the idea because you study a textbook and you think, oh, the cell, we know there's a nucleus, there's Golgi, there's CR, there's Perak, Perox, you know, no, <laughs> there is so much that we don't know yet. Don't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> so uh, Tim actually follows up on that with, okay. um, what is your lab currently working on and what are some exciting items that you guys are hoping to discover in the next couple of years? Very good. So um, my lab works in two completely different areas of, of biology. One has to do with polymers. So this is... Um, the structures in the cell that are made by self-assembly of, of a repeating protein unit um, in the context of their requirement in cell division. Okay, so I told you microtubules do this amazing thing of serving as railroad tracks and also pulling chromosomes. They obviously don't do it by themselves. There are many, many proteins that bind to them. Many by the hundreds, okay? And some of them are changing the way microtubules assemble. Some of them are attaching microtubules to certain structures uh, in the cell, like the plasma membrane or the endoplasmic reticulum, many different. And we want to see how those things interact. At the end of the day, biology comes from interaction of macromolecules that are dynamic and that do work or move things around in, in the cell or whatever. So we are studying, there are hundreds of them. This is one reason to study microtubules because you can dedicate your entire life to just um, study different aspects of them. So this is one of the things we do. Um, in particular, we are interested in the protein structures that serve as the, as the glue between microtubules and chromosomes, okay? How do these two entities engage? There are proteins that can grab onto both sides and we are studying those. But the other half of the lab actually is involved in another very essential process, which is gene expression. This is a very general way of referring to a number of steps that start with the copy of DNA into messenger RNA that then will be read into proteins, to, will be used to make proteins. So we study the molecular machines that go 
to the beginning of a gene, find where a gene starts in, 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 in the whole genome, um, open the DNA, put the polymerase there, and then help the polymerase copy that gene, that piece of DNA into a messenger RNA. Um, and this machinery is very complicated. And, and again, if we want to understand it at the atomic level, we need powerful methods for visualizing them and visualizing these machines in different states. And this process, again, is very highly regulated. Regulation is the word always in biology. Every process has to have many layers of regulation that come with many different proteins or RNAs that are interacting with, with each other. So another area where there is so much room for expansion because it's so fundamental that this has many layers of regulation. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, thank you to everybody who's been tuning in, and thank you, Dr. Nogales, for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, we had a great time chatting with you. Um, any any last comments or anything? No, I just want to say thank you for uh, your time, and I think you uh, you know what you said uh, will be very inspiring for many people uh, who are tuning in live and uh, and who'll be watching on YouTube. So. Very good. It was it was great talking to you guys, and I and I hope this is useful for someone, especially um, uh, to women. No, women are men. I have to I have two boys uh, in in high school, both of which have certain tendencies for science. But I, I think it's inspiring. Um, hopefully, it's inspiring to young people that, um, especially in the biology field, have to realize so much to be learned and so many possibilities for you to make a contribution. So thank you very much for having me.